business is currently moving faster than ever. Today is the slowest day. It will never get slower than it is today. Hello, I'm Angela Barnes and thank you for watching The Big Question, our new business series from Euronews where we sit down with industry leaders and experts to discuss some of the most important topics on today's agenda. And today I'm joined by Frederick Pearson, the president of Business Europe, and he is a leading advocate for growth and competitiveness in Europe. Frederick. Great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Angela, for having me. It's a great opportunity. Business Europe, we know, is known for standing up for companies across the continent and campaigning on the issues that most influence their performance. So, first of all, tell us about the work of Business Europe and what those key issues are at the moment. We represent member federations from 36 European countries. So it's not only the EU 27, it's broader. So we are on the ground 24-7 in, in Europe and representing close to 20 million companies. So I can hand on heart really say we're the voice of European business. And representing those 20 million companies, we're also the voice of the Europeans. So I do not see the separation between companies, employees. I mean, it is a, a, a network and that's why I'm so passionate about this and trying to make Europe the place to be, to invest and, the, and protect the European way of life, which is great. I can see your passion, Frederick. Yeah. When you're speaking to that huge network, what among them is the sort of the key issues that are are coming up a lot at the moment. What's their sort of major concerns at the moment? This is a big election year. Firstly, I think it's a surprisingly united view, regardless if you're an SME, small company in, in Finland, a multinational global company out of France, a local company in, in Italy. The key concern is that Europe is falling behind in terms of competitiveness. Our competitors in Asia and in the US are performing better. If we just look at the numbers and the growth in Europe, it is falling behind. This has nothing to do with the pandemic or the Russian war in Ukraine. That has increased the pace, but already ahead of the pandemic, Europe was unfortunately falling behind. And the key thing that's gonna happen here is we're setting a lot of ambitious goals within the EU on the green transition, on the digital transition, and now also on the geopolitical transition. None of those goals will be achievable if we don't get back into a growth mode in, in Europe. But we're really calling the alarm bells saying to the politicians, hey, we seriously have a problem here and now. And Frederick, if it wasn't the pandemic and it wasn't the Russia-Ukraine crisis, yep. as you stated there, why has Europe fallen so far behind its competitors? When asking our members today, they, they call out three key topics that is sort of hampering competitiveness and, and creating the lack of growth. The first one is the cost of energy. That for sure is related to first the pandemic, but foremost, the war in Ukraine, which has put Europe at a disadvantage. A year ago, we had even higher prices, and they have now come down, but even at the current level, post-pandemic prices are twice in Europe, as we saw before. If you go to the US, they're up about 30%. So we're losing out against our US competitors and our Asian competitors. The second one that's being called out, and that one was even there before the pandemic, that is the regulation. We're so keen in Europe to regulate things. I mean, as an example, in the, in the last five years, we have had close to 100 new uh, laws being passed on, on European level, and that is adding 5,000 pages of new regulatory text to, to the companies. It, it basically means that currently you're getting a new regulation every second day. For a big company, 
This is a hassle. But they have the structure, they have departments to handle it. They lose out on competitiveness. But if you're an SME, 99% of those 20 million companies are SMEs. What happens with them? They either go out of business, they decide not to enter a new market, and they are the backbone of the large caps. Because if we don't have the SMEs, the large caps will, will, will falter as well. And we need to, to stop this. It's good that we have regulation, but we need less regulation and better regulation. And that was a challenge way before the pandemic, way before the, the Russian war in, in, in Ukraine. And the third is a combination, I would say, of talking about resilience and, and openness. I think we learned a lesson from the, the pandemic that supply chains were maybe pushed to the limit. And of course, with, uh, with the Russian war in Ukraine, that has been challenged again. We need to cherish the single market we have. That is a gem for, for the EU. You don't find that anywhere else. It's the biggest market you have. But to the point we discussed a bit before here, there are still challenges within, within the single market. It's 30 years old. It's a vibrant and, and strong 30 year old, but we need to push down those hinders that are still out there. And that comes to services. It comes to data because the market has changed a lot in 30 years. 30 years ago, we didn't even have the smartphone. So, so that needs to be strengthened. And lastly, the openness of, of trade, really getting the best out of our the gem of the EU, the single market, and opening up for the possibility to, to source from, from other countries. If we do that, I'm positive, then Europe will get back in, in the number one position. If we don't, it's a bleak outlook, honestly. And I'm not being alarmistic, I'm just calling it the way we see it. I read on your website that if all barriers to the free movement of goods and services were abolished, the single market could unleash 713 billion euros by the end of 2029. That's an It's astonishing. one of those humongous numbers. You're, you're just like, when I first heard it, I said, have we done the calculus wrong? It's uh, incredible. Um, yeah. And in your view, Frederick, are there any countries on the continent that are making it easier to do business, that are leading by example? I wouldn't say that it's specifically a particular country doing it. I mean, we find sort of positive pockets across, across the boards. We, we did a study on, on permitting mm -hmm. and I was like, permitting again, isn't that extremely boring? No, but it, it doesn't come with a cost. Actually, it's, it's, it's less expensive to have a faster permitting process than a slower one. And honestly, there is not only about the EU. There's a lot of EU bashing and saying it's, it's all about the Commission or, or, or the Commission president. But there are challenges also on the, on the national level. There we saw some really good examples in, in Greece, where they had on a national level come up with a sort of faster permitting procedure. So if, if we can build both on a political level and on a business industry level on, on the good examples uh, uh, across Europe, I, I think will be a tough match for, for, for all our, our competitors, for, for sure. Frederick, that's really interesting and you, you've mentioned a couple of pocket of those examples yeah. there. Uh, where is Europe leading the way? Is there any sector where you feel that Europe is leading the way? The way I look at that to get the answer of that question, I, I like to, to go to the US. What are they doing? Because to your point, if you look, look back over the last 15 years, one reason behind the sort of stellar growth in the US versus Europe is, of course, the way they moved within, within tech. So where do they see that they have the weakness? I mean, when you look at the IRA, there has been a lot of upset on, on EV vehicles, but we have to step back and say, why does US politicians think it's worth to do the, the IRA move? So obviously they've made the comparative study and said, we're falling behind on green technology. We're falling behind Europe. We really need to step up our game on green technologies when it comes to batteries, wind farms, etc. So for me, that is really the sign, okay, this is where we're doing well. I would also call out sort of maybe the sort of the boring parts of the industry backbone when it comes to the way sort of industry 4.0 as it's called, how do you sort of put up the, the factory of the future? 
We have a huge skill set of that in, in Germany, in Czech Republic, uh, Northern Italy, etc. We're really strong on that. I mean, if, if you build the factory of the future, anywhere in the world, be it in China, US, trust me, there will be Northern Italian engineers setting up that factory. So there we're really, really strong. And this is the, the market of, of, of the future. So I see the Inflation Reduction Act and what the Americans are trying to do to reindustrialize the US, given the success that we had within technology. That is the best acid test of where is Europe performing really well. Mm -hmm. And what about the, the worst? For, for Europe, are we up to date uh, with the AI innovation? No, I think that, that that will be a challenge. I would even take take a step further back and look at what is being invested in in innovation and, and R and D, going all the way back to to our educational systems, the universities, how we are educating our young within uh, sort of uh, maths and, and sort of. The, 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 the standard uh, things to, to know, getting more engineers. Because if, if you look now, Europe invests roughly 2% plus in this, or it's, it's 2.3. The Chinese have just passed us at 2.4. And of course, they're a huge economy. The US is above 3%. And uh, this is like investing in your pension or saving for your house. If we don't do the forward-looking investments, we save money today, but we're going to look really bad in five to ten years. So, so there I think we have a joint responsibility from the political side, but also from business and industry. We need to invest and dare to invest in, in the future. And how do you get companies to invest? Better and less regulation, faster permitting times, the predictability, because companies do want to invest in Europe just don't make it a hassle to, to invest in, in, in Europe. Make it easy. And what about the tax incentives, Frederick, as well, but, and harmonizing that? That's a huge challenge, isn't it? It, it? it is. And a year ago or two years ago, there was all this discussion about, oh, business, they only want new investment funds and we need to match the, the IRA. I don't think you heard me a single time during this discussion bring that up as, as sort of a, a key topic. Honestly, if, if we could just get the affordable energy, the better regulation, the faster permitting, tear down the existing walls within the single market, save your money. That, that is, that, there will be points where that is important, where you get a, a, a short-term market shock, where I think you need to step in, where there are new emerging technologies that sort of need a push from governments to, to get into the, to the water, so to speak. But this is not about the money. This is about the competitiveness. You can never subsidize a company or a region or a country into competitiveness. I mean, that's sort of the flip side of competitiveness. Business want to do it on their own. And, and if we don't do it well, then we shouldn't be in business. Uh, we, we, we do, that's, that's the way it should, should work. So more related to tearing down ob obstacles in, in, in the single market. But this is not about uh, subsidizing our way to success. I would venture to say if we don't get the growth, how should we then be able to keep up uh, the welfare systems we have in Europe, uh, the way of life we have, the free education we have? The only other option is, of course, then we need to, to, to borrow from the, the generations to come. And I think that would be totally unacceptable. Who are we to leverage generations to come? Frederick, on that very strong note, I'm going to uh, end the show there because we've got a lot of food for thought. Thank you, and as I always say, we are what we're called. We're Business Europe. That's what we work for, and that's what we love. Well, Frederick, thank you very much. And that <laughs> thank you. very much comes across. And thank you all for watching this episode of The Big Question. And you can catch all our shows on the Euronews YouTube channel. And you can also head across to the Euronews.com website, hit the business page section, and all of our Big Question episodes are also there. Thank you very much for watching.